Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe by Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform. I'm Larry Bishop, and you're listening to The World Is Wrong Podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about you. The, the Hot, hot Rock. rock. <laughs> Welcome to The World Is is wrong an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films that the world is wrong about i'm one of your hosts andras jones and i'm brian Connolly. what do you do are you are you one of the hosts or are you just a guest on the show i'm the i'm the, I'm the janitor i'm just like mopping you, you don't mind me you don't mind me <laughs> like in this uh, would you say that in this podcast you're the driver or you're the locksmith <laughs> or are you the de- are you the the explosives expert <laughs> <laughs> I'm the explosives expert. Oh no way, man! You're the you're the you're the mastermind. That you picked this. You're the Robert Redford of this production. We are talking about 1972's The Hot Rock, directed by Peter Yates and starring Robert Redford. And uh, I just want to say we're we're recording this on Election Day, November third, 2020, in the morning. And I just think it's interesting that sort of the next two weeks of this podcast are going to be like all the president's crimes. Uh, as <laughs> this week we're focusing on the hot rock starring Robert Redford, and next week we'll be digging into Straight Time from uh, 1978 starring Dustin Hoffman. And in between these films, the two made one of my favorite, All the President's Men from 1976. And just, you know, and, and obviously there's going to be probably some presidential crimes going on just today. So uh, <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Is that why you picked you'll this be film? Listening... <laughs> no, I you know I didn't even think about it. I was like, that's a good movie. Let's watch that one. <laughs> I you know I don't think that far. I, like I'm not. My life is so just entrenched in just movies that I have no idea what's going on in reality. Like it's a, you know, mm. and I refuse to watch documentaries, so I really have no idea even through movies. Oh man, I you, uh, yeah. a lot of us are <laughs> a lot of us envy you. <laughs> but, but maybe I'm part of the problem. I don't know. <laughs> wait, and you told me earlier this week I, I, that uh, there was a there was sort of an attempted I don't know sort of. I don't know, attempt on the life of a campaign bus, a Joe, a Joe Biden campaign campaign bus was run off the road, not far yeah. from your home in Pflugerville, Texas. Is that is that uh, true? not quite not quite like between like kind of more towards San Antonio, which is not too terribly far from here. But yeah, like some some trucks boxed in a Biden van or whatever and wouldn't let them make their way to their next campaign stop. So you're in the hotbed. Of I'm in the hotbed. The, the revolution <laughs> and the potential civil war. In Olympia, Washington, where I am, it is pouring rain. And I'm just like, oh, well, you know, no one's going to, that's going to kill. Like, all these places are afraid that, that there's going to be trouble in downtown. It's like, they're not going to come out when it's pouring down rain. We have, this work, <laughs> I live in Slacker Town. Even the, like, the right wingers, like, the radical, like everyone's just going to be like, oh, it's too much. I'm staying home. I, I like the idea of like, man, I'm going to cause some trouble. Oh, it's raining. Eh, it's just not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Such a Washington move. <laughs> See, it's nice and hot and sunny here in Texas. So anyone who wants to cause trouble, beautiful weather whenever you want to do that. So. <laughs> so let's get into let's get into talking about this film, The Hot Rock, shall yeah. we? Yeah, uh, please. Let's go to a clip, and then uh, you can tell us about the film. It's good and it's bad. There's a guaranteed return, and that's good. But the guarantor is a Musa, and a Musa is a rookie, and that's bad. But it's an easily transportable object, and that's good. Only it's in a rotten position in the museum, 30 steps to the quickest exit, and that's bad. 
And the glass over the stone, that's bad too, because that's glass with metal mixed in it, bulletproof, shatterproof. But the locks don't look impossible, three, maybe five tumblers, but there's no alarm system, and that's the worst, because that means no one's going to get lazy watching, knowing the alarm will pick up their mistakes, which means the whole thing has got to be a diversion job. And that's good and that's bad, because if the diversion's too big, it'll draw pedestrians, and if the diversion's not big enough, it won't draw that watchman. Oh, Monroe, I don't know where the hell you are. What the hell you say? Just tell me, will you plan the job? That's what I do. All right, the hot rock. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this. Uh, so we have a. It's directed by Peter Yates, who did Bullet, and the Friends of Eddie Coyle, and I believe Kroll. <laughs> I think that's one of his later movies. Uh, and what's great about this is it's a it's a comedy. It really is like a fun comedy. And like Bullet was fun, but it definitely is kind of more on the tough, serious, cool side with Steve McQueen. And then Friends of Eddie Coyle made on the other in a hot rock is not funny at all. It's just like a very serious kind of dark, also kind of uh, heisty sort of movie. But this, what's interesting is this is based on a book by Donald Westlake, who wrote the book that the movie Point Blank is based on. Uh, and also Payback uh, with Mel Gibson. And so th those movies are kind of known for being kind of tough and violent. And this movie has some darkness in there, but for the most part, it's kind of breezy, kind of fun. I really, I really like it a lot. And the plot, the basic plot, is Robert Redford plays this character named Dortmunder. He's fresh out of prison. His other friend, Kelp, played by George Siegel, ropes him into this, uh, like, where they're going to steal this diamond that used to belong to some African country, and Moses Gunn plays uh, sort of like the person representing that country being like, steal this diamond from me, I'll pay you money. And so they get the kind of, basically, it's implied that they're getting the old team back together and a few new faces. And so you have Ron Liebman as Merch, and he's sort of the I drive the cars, I can fly the helicopter sort of guy. And then you have Paul, the great Paul Sand as Greenberg, and he's the demolition explosions expert. And it's basically like they try to steal this diamond, and then they keep having to steal it because they keep fucking up. There's something that keeps happening where they're just going to keep moving from one place to the next to try to get this diamond. And it takes them many, many attempts to get it. And that's the movie. And it's very funny. And it's very much like in the vein of like the classic heist comedy, uh, which I, I'm a fan of that genre. I'm a fan of like, let's get a team, like Ocean's Eleven. Let's get a team of character actors together and let's go steal a thing to some cool music by Quincy Jones, which is what this movie's soundtrack is by. Uh, I love this movie a lot. Yeah, there's a lot to love. Now, uh, how do you think the world is wrong about the hot rock? Uh, well, I mean, first off, this movie, for whatever reason, was a box office failure. Uh, the public did not come out to see this movie, despite starring Robert Redford and George Siegel, who at the time were pretty big stars. Major. It just, major stars. Like, this is 1972? Yeah. And nobody came. And then the other thing is maybe due to that, this is like a 70s movie that no one really talks about, and I've never really heard much about it and it's just weird that nobody talks about this because everyone talks about i feel like every other robert redford movie from the 70s and every other you know peter yates movie from the 70s um but like this movie for whatever reason lost to time i don't know <laughs> but but when i saw it i was like this is a movie i should have seen a long time ago and i've seen it now three times in the last month <laughs> so i'm excited to, t to kind of talk about this with you have you seen this movie before yeah yes i had um and i liked it and i had some i had i had my own uh interesting reaction to it that we'll get into i just want to put it in the context of robert redford's career so he really <laughs> broke out with butch Ca and butch cassidy and the sundance yeah. kid was the film that made him a superstar he was already a star you know and it Barefoot in the Park, The Chase, lots of films in the in the sixties and TV in the sixties. But after Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, he had four films: Downhill Racer, Tell Them Willie Boy Is Here, Little Foss, and Big Halsey, and The Hot Rock. That you know were 
I wouldn't say were like they weren't hits on the level of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but coming right out of the hot rock, he does Jeremiah Johnson, The Candidate, The Way We Were, and The Sting, and that and that seems like his really he's beginning to figure out how to be a movie star. But I think that's kind of what makes the hot rock so great is that it's still you still got a hungry Robert Redford you know trying to prove himself a little bit as a star and he I think he's great in this film what do you think he he's just so charming and so funny like it's it, like I I mean I used to not like Robert Redford at all like I used to think he was just really boring and I didn't get it I did not understand it and then recently in the last year, I've seen enough of his stuff now that I'm like, oh, I get it now. Oh, he's great. Okay. And, um, you know, in this movie, he's, he's like George Clooney. He's like this handsome, charming, funny, wise guy. You know, he's just so good in it. And I mean, he's playing a character named Dortmunder. Like that's not like when you look at Robert Redford, he does not look like a Dortmunder. And I think that's funny too. Like that, like he's just like really plain. I think he's kind of playing a bit with his image here, like what we know so far of him. Like there's a part where a baby pees on him and he's really disappointed and sad. So it's like, this is where he's at in his career. (laughs) He's okay to be a little bit foolish. It reminds me, like I said, of like when George Clooney kind of broke through and like started doing the Coen Brothers movies and wasn't afraid to be a little more funny and less concerned with being kind of this leading guy. Yeah, I mean, it that quality is there. Like the like Sundance is definitely. I think of as him as a comedic character, and he and it's that Robert Redford yeah. thing where it's like, it's all he underplays. I, that's the thing I love about Robert Redford is it's just sort of like he's a, he's a lesson in movie star acting. Like if you've got yeah. that charisma, if you've got everything working for you, you don't have to, you don't have to push it that hard. You know, you just very true. You can really and especially and this film's got the A team because you got William Goldman writing your script. You've got Quincy Jones doing your music. You got Peter Yates directing it. And you're surrounded by these other great actors. It really it's this is Robert Redford can is one that it's a film that he can afford to like let the script do the work, let the director do the let a lot of things happen around him. And he's just really, really strong at the center of it. Um, and then Gil Goldman gives him some great lines, too. Yeah. And what I like about this movie and what really struck me about it is that it's not about anything really that important. Like it's not trying to make some big statement. It is just sort of like a fun movie. But it's the fun movie made by like really, really good people. And I love it when a, when a movie like that exists where it's like, yeah, in a way it's breezy when you talk about like the content, but because you have these great people behind the scenes and in front of the camera, like the movie is just heightened to a level where it's not just some stupid, forgettable 90 minute of nothing. Like there's, it's like, it's got so much Wait a second. Talent. You left someone like a major star out of your description of this. Do you know who you left out? Oh, uh, Zero Mostel is in this damn movie. Uh, which, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And in 1972, <laughs> Zero Mostel was like a big, like he was a, like one of those actors, co- like really well respected, comedic, also Broadway star. He's a big get for your film. Oh yeah, and yeah, he has that thing where he shows up halfway through it, and every scene he's in, it's his scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it's just the amount of talent in this is so, it's like, every, and everybody's doing great. Like, I don't think George Siegel's ever been so cool in a movie. Like, he just seems like a really cool guy. Like, it just, it does, it, you know, like, this movie reminds me of, like, yeah, like, Ocean's Eleven. But instead of the Rat Pack, you're having, like, these more, less... Yeah, you know, like just like less cool, I guess, when you think about it, but like they seem cool in this movie. Like George Siegel, I've never thought of as being really cool or or uh, Ron Liebman. <laughs> but in this movie, they seem really fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, although none of them are as cool to me as Paul Sands. I'm a huge <laughs> Paul Sands fan. We don't get enough Paul Sands. In fact, as I was watching the film, there was a part of me that's thinking, I really wish Paul Sands was playing the the, the George Siegel role and George <laughs> Siegel was playing the Paul Sands role. 
I just think, you know, I'm just, and I, it's funny, I was trying to figure out what it was that, so just to fill people in, Paul Sands was one of the original Second City players oh. with Alan Arkin. Oh, wow. And so he, he goes back to that crew. And then, but I have such really, really fond feelings about him. And it, I think it probably came from his TV appearances mm-hmm. when I was a kid. Like he's in Bewitched and he's in Mary Tyler Moore. But I went back and watched those and I was like, no, nah, I don't. I mean, they're good, but I haven't found the thing. There must be some show that he was on. Yeah, what locked That it I in? saw when I was a kid. And I was just like. I like that guy. And then I, he's because he never became a big star, whenever he shows up in anything, it's just such a treat. But yeah. I feel like this is one of his bigger roles. And he's, I think he's great in it. I love him. I oh, absolutely love him in this film. Another weird thing, and I guess it doesn't count as a cameo because he wasn't famous yet, but Christopher Guest, like a really young Christopher Guest shows up as a cop. But like this is oh, 19, I did, 1972 oh. Christopher Guest. Yeah. Sir, bombs. The bombs in the street, sir. Yeah, that is that pre Lemmings, National Lampoon's I, Lemmings. I think so. I yeah, think that would have to be because or right around that time. Yeah, I think it would probably be before. Yeah. Also, in uh, one of my favorite, just weird little scenes, there's a great scene where Ron Liebman has a bootleg of the Indy 500. <laughs> <laughs> that he plays for his mother, who's played by Charlotte Ray. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just sitting, listening to cars driving around in his garage. Hey, look what I bought! Brand new! What is it? The Tony Speedway Stereo! Oh, play it for me, Stan. Could use a little cheering. <laughs> Okay, Ma! Uh, a little more treble, Stan! What? Treble, treble, right. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that, that scene feels like the kind of quirky scene that you would have seen in, like, a more recent comedy. Like, that, like, feels like, like, that seems like something you'd see in a movie. Like post it's 90s. almost over the top, but I, but I dig it. I loved it. <laughs> my my favorite scene is when the initial pitch from Moses Gunn of the thing, and they're like on separate park benches, and, and the old this, lady sits down between and the old them. lady sits between them, and then they have to kind of awkwardly <laughs> move around her, and they're kind of doing this weird dance where they're trying to remain incognito, but they can't hear each other, and then Robert Redford kind of walks away, and then it's a lot of like. George Siegel yelling after Robert Redford. And so it's like this, the, the use of space in that scene. Like that is to me a masterful scene. Like that's Peter Yates being a great filmmaker. Like I love that scene. Like that's the, what kind of sealed the movie for me. Like that part, I was like, okay, I'm into what this movie's doing. Well, actually, so to balance that out, there is a moment that I, I think it's, I'm going to be a slightly critical of it, but it's, I want to be, it's, it's, demonstrative of a dynamic that I think is worth exploring. And I'm curious if you noticed this. So in the scene, so basically Robert Redford gets out of prison. He gets picked up by George Siegel, who can't, for some reason, can't drive his car and almost runs over, (laughs) runs Redford over. And then Redford punches him in like a classic, like people don't punch people in movies the way they used to in the (laughs) seventies or in real life anymore. (laughs) friends like this is like they're friends he's just like ah, i'm just gonna give you a big haymaker and knock you out (laughs) and then so then they're driving and they have this whole bit where it's like i'm not gonna do a job what job blah 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 and then at the ends on this button of like now let me tell you a a little bit about the job and this is one of those things where i really love peter yates as a director but he lets the moment hang for just like a second or two longer after he says it. So it's like now about this job and he, it sort of, it leaves him hanging. And it's like, so there's, I feel like there's like two points in this one as an actor. It's like why you never play to the, like you always play through the end of the scene as written. So if he had played it through, like now, let me tell you a little bit about the job. It's a blah, 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 blah. And da, 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 da. And he start kept going. 
then he wouldn't have stopped the action. But if you watch him, he just sort of like gives the punchline as it's written and then just keeps his hand in the air. And then the director, <laughs> Peter Yates, I'm sorry, man, but you left George Hink Siegel hanging. You should have cut that scene just a <laughs> second before because it really took me out. It's funny. I was talking with my friend Alan, who I'm going to interview for a little piece about this that we'll talk later. And he was talking about the film and he's like, there was this one moment that really took me out of it. And it was that. And he was like, and he thought it was because George Siegel gave a bad performance. But I'm like, I don't think George Siegel gave a bad performance. I mean, again, it's a lesson like as actors, if you're going to act at movies, don't if you're going to hit the punchline at the end of a scene, don't stop acting just when you hit the punchline. But if you're a director and you notice your actor did that, cut him some slack. Just cut that <laughs> little second out. And then you don't look like he doesn't look like a dork. Anyway, uh, it's still it's it's I have I have like two little quibbles like that, like technical quibbles for Peter Yates. But overall, like other things like what you're talking about, like with the old lady sitting down between them, I had that same reaction of like, oh, this is great. And I just loved it. <laughs> And I don't know if this is a Donald Westlake thing, but like even though this movie's fun and silly, the violence in it is upsetting, even the fake violence. So like there's a part where Ron Liebman pretends to crash a well he does crash a car but does it in a way like a stuntman where he's okay, but then pretends to be dying from this car wreck. And it's kind of upsetting like they're using it as a ruse to like distract security guards so they can break into a museum. But, like, when you think about, like, what these people think is going on, it's, like, really upsetting. This guy's just bleeding out and dying on the street in front of this museum. Like, that part was striking of, like, God, that's, like, kind of dark. Like, that's not, like, it's not really funny. Like, there's no joke going on. It's just a guy pretending to die a horrible death for many minutes of the movie. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but what was the most upsetting to me about that scene is the obvious ramp that the car <laughs> rides up to have to crash. And then if you watch it, that you can see the cable. There's this cable that keeps it from spinning into the uh, the the uh, museum where they're pulling off the heist. And again, I'm like, Peter Yates, come on. You could have just, if you just, <laughs> didn't, you didn't see that that cable was right in the shot? It's so obvious. Well, I mean, maybe and it's on a big can... screen. <laughs> Maybe they can only crash their car once. Like, well, we can't do it again, so we just got to keep yeah. that cable in the shot. Yeah, we <laughs> we can only afford. You know, we spent all our money on Quincy Jones. We can't afford a second car. Uh, then, then the other scene of violence is upsetting is the scene later on where they're pretending to throw Paul Sand down an elevator shaft and threatening to throw yep. Zero Mustel down. And uh, spoiler alert, like watch this movie before we talk about it because we can give away some twists. But like it's all fake. Like they don't really throw him down. But that's but the way it's done, like by the point of that movie, you think that they're really doing it. You think like Robert Redford's kind of cracked and he wants this money, so he's gonna really throw him down the elevator shaft and kill him. And it's not like there's no joke in that part until the end when you realize that it was made up. And again, I think it's like in my mind, I think because this was a Donald Westlake book. Like, I was just thinking of parts of Point Blank of like, oh, that part when Lee Marvin threw that guy out the window and he died. Like, like it's all the violence in that movie is real. There's no jokes. It's just Lee Marvin, Lee Marvin, like walking through San Francisco, killing people, punching people. And so I thought this movie was kind of taking a dark turn. And then every time it was like, oh, no, it's a gag. <laughs> but those scenes are not played for laughs, like until the end. It's very no, no. It was, <laughs> it was really that was very disturbing, and I wondered because for me, you know, we've discussed this in other episodes, but uh, seeing these two Jewish actors, Zero Mostel and Paul Sand, playing obviously Jewish characters, and the way that this sort of blonde Aryan looking dust, uh, Robert Redford turns on them <laughs> and just the scene, like something that it plays like whether it's subtly just for me or the something that is more universal on something about like Jewish terror and you're being sold out by basically Paul Sands. If they did throw him off that is sort of being scapegoated so that they can get the jewels from his dad. And all of that just feels like, yeah, it just has like you kind of believe that's maybe that's part of why you believe that this is real, that it's real. And then when it turns out that Paul Sand was in on the joke the whole time or not the joke on in on 
trying to get it from and it sort of becomes a joke at the end but a yeah. real dark joke yeah uh it's like it's it's a, it's cathartic but i do feel like there's something in that scene that references a certain kind of jewish terror that makes it even more like just adds that little turn of the knife and maybe that's just for me as a viewer but uh, i mean you know william goldman's a smart man and i wouldn't you know be surprised if he was trying to work some interesting stuff into these scenes like that you know like he is an yeah. ex- he's an excellent writer <laughs> And I kind of want to go back to the uh, to the opening for a second because sure. there was something I noticed. So first of all, the Quincy Jones score to this film, great, is God, it's so good. It's just so like from the second it kicks in, you're like, oh, this is groovy. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and but did you notice? So they the opening is Robert Redford getting out of prison, and he's mm-hmm. walking down this hall in his prison garb, and he's changing into and he he's they're bringing him his clothes so he can change into his clothes. And right when you know this hot movie star is just a, like taking off his shirt, the Quincy Jones score just hints at a kind of a striptease kind of vibe. <laughs> It's so subtle, but it's the kind of thing that is like, it's not so subtle that it's like the person who's writing it isn't intentionally putting it in there. And you just sort of feel like it's like this nod to like, this is, hey, ladies, this is going to be fun. (laughs) I also noticed, and I rarely have ever seen this in a movie, they list like all the members of the band that played the Quincy Jones music in the credits. Like they actually say like who played, did you notice that? Like they listed out like... The Quincy Jones with these guys, like I don't remember who they were, but like I found that interesting that they were like credited the people who played the music with him. Maybe because it's jazzy, so maybe there's some improvisation and Quincy Jones wanted to give credit where credit was due, or I don't know what. But I really liked that. I don't. I've never seen that in a movie before. Yeah, I, it makes me want to find looking in the. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a Ray Brown. Oh, yeah, Carol Kay played bass on it. Yeah, Gary Mulligan, this is baritone sax, Bobby Porter on the congas, Chuck Rainey on the Fender bass, Emil Richards, percussion, Jerome Richardson, sax, and Frank Rossellino, trombone. Let me see what Clark Terry on trumpet, Grady Tate, drums. Wow. Talent. This is a, <laughs> it's. I mean, yeah. It's a. It's a long list of great musicians, and some of them I'm very aware of. Partic- you know, particularly Ray Brown, Carol Kay, and Gary Mulligan. Is it Jerry Mulligan? It's, it's, it's spelled with a G, so I just call him Gary. But maybe it's Jerry. I don't know. <laughs> now I'm. In, now I'm. I'm feeling nervous. But uh, yeah, I mean that's why you give them credits because you get those. You know, that's that's just part of this A team of talent. Like this is this film is so set up to succeed, but why didn't it? Like, what it in didn't. 1972 were people like, no, I don't want that. Uh, like, this isn't the Godfather or whatever. So I'm not going to watch this fun. Maybe it's like, no, world is too bad right now. 1972 times are tough. Like, I don't want to watch some breezy thing. I want to like see something challenging. Like, where's the new Altman film? Like, why are we watching this heist comedy? <laughs> I don't get it. This movie should be a very popular movie that everyone remembers fondly, but they don't. <laughs> you know who I think remembers it fondly? Oh, I know. Steven Soderbergh. Steven Soderbergh. I think, <laughs> I think like... Steven Soderbergh. This feels so much like this. It feels a lot like Out of Sight. It reminds me of Out of Sight more yeah. than Ocean's Eleven. Not like, well, yeah, in a lot of ways, like, like Out of Sight. It has oh. that... Well, you were going to say something, yeah. No, no, I'm just, I'm green, yeah. Like, it's just, like, the, it's, I feel like I saw a lot of Steven Soderbergh in this movie. Like, it, like he, I feel like, must, this. I didn't see it anywhere in the world, but he must consider this one of his favorite movies. Like, there's no way that he hasn't watched this movie a lot. And, because he rips it off a lot, or homages to it. <laughs> like, just, like, yeah, like, the, the jazzy soundtrack, the way that, like, Out of Sight is another movie where, like, the violence... And the dark parts are dark, but then it's really, really funny. And you have this great cast of characters and all these great actors and, again, talent, you know, making a movie that on paper sounds kind of breezy and fun, you know. But, like, but because of the talent behind it, it's, like, so much more than that. And, like, I think he just must be a Donald Westlake fan, too, because the limey feels very much like Point Blank. 
So like I think he just is like loves a Donald Westlake based movie from the late sixties, early seventies. Like, did you ever see Logan Lucky? A lot of Logan Lucky I saw in this movie as well. Oh yeah. Like just like the way the way the characters are introduced reminds me of sort of Logan Lucky and the Soderbergh Oceans movies. The way that you're like, and now this guy, and this is what he does, and like the way that every scene kind of works as its own thing. Like I the scene, especially when Paul Sand is trying out the different levels of dynamite and Robert Redford no, I keep love pushing that. him to make it bigger. That felt like yeah. a scene from like a Logan Lucky or Ocean's Eleven remake. I was like, totally. that seems like a scene of Brad Pitt. Make It's like the way the humor and the way that it sort of like has this relaxed nature to the whole thing, even though like stakes are constantly getting raised. Like it kind of has that sort of cool, calm, collected feel in the way that those Soderbergh kind of crime comedies feel. Yeah. Now you mentioned a scene where uh, a baby pees on Robert Redford's <laughs> lap. That baby is the is the baby of his sister, who's married to the George Siegel character, and his sister is played by Topo Swope. And are you familiar with Topo Swope? No, but that's a great name. Yeah, she. Wasn't in many movies. She was in Pretty Maids all in a row. Great she was in movie. The Hot Rock. She was in an episode of Starsky and Hutch from 1979. And then she moved to Seattle and started an agency for actors here. So there's there's a Topo Swope agency in Seattle. I feel like that's like the actor equivalent of like the writer who just becomes like a professor at the community college in another town. And you find out he published he or she published a book a long time ago, like, you know, like I had a few professors like that of like, I had a book that I published 20 years ago and I'll make sure you buy it and read it for the curriculum. But I'm now teaching at this little college. I'm like, I didn't quite make it in the way that I hoped I did, you know, but you're still sticking to what you know. So it's like, you're an actor, but it's, you know, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough business. So you're going to now support other actors and hopefully maybe boost them getting roles in Seattle, <laughs> like not a lot of films get made there, but it's good to have someone looking out for people to get them some work. If there's a commercial, I'm guessing for something. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's another scene that happens when she, that it doesn't actually involve her, but I thought it was really funny. I'm curious if you, if this stuck out to you. So after the, uh, the first crime, the first heist where they steal a jewel from a museum in a very sloppy and weird heist that doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, but still, it works. But afterwards, George Siegel's reading the newspaper about it and he's like, and in a dazzlingly successful operation, these blah, 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 blah. Like, Is this a review? Like who writes, like what newspaper writes about a crime and calls it a dazzling it's, successful operation? It's what Rex Reed operation. did before he was a film critic. He was like writing reviews of heists in crime. He did the police blotter for that. Four stars for this. Oh, like William Goldman. Is this a joke? That bank robbery, <laughs> like, two thumbs up. What? <laughs> <laughs> two thumbs up <laughs> they got away you know but, maybe there's just some really bad you know newspaper writers in new york city in 1972 <laughs> it's really terrible like this is the <laughs> where this is the pro-crime yeah, time like, did you see what newspaper it was like maybe it was just like the little penny paper from the grocery store like you know this is pre-internet so people did like you know if you were a bad writer and wanted to be known maybe you just wrote for some crappy little paper <laughs> that reviews Bank robberies. <laughs> yeah, if you're a criminal, you don't get the New York crime Times. Time. You buy the Crime Times. Like, yeah. <laughs> I did notice that. That is very. That is a very weird scene where you're like, I don't. Is this supposed to be a joke? <laughs> like, is this like it's a weird way to relate information and kind of unnecessary because you saw it happen. So really, it's just because that part is just for them mm. to be like. And now we got to figure out how to get it next. Like, <laughs> and he's so excited about it. He's like, "Oh, I can't believe we got a great review for our for our heist where we didn't even get the diamond." Like, maybe that is how news should be written. Like, maybe like when you just have something that's bad but not terrible bad, make it interesting. You know, just like, "Oh yeah, there's a bank robbery," but like, make it sound exciting. Yeah, that's 
Yeah, that's how that's how the newspapers look at crime. There's like <laughs> there's bad, but not really bad. Stealing property, you know, like stuff like that. That doesn't that doesn't matter. It's not like real crime, like corporate crime, or like. <laughs> It's it's one it's I I I love it. I mean, it's one of those those moments where I'm like, okay, well, this is a movie that is taking some things seriously and other things not serious. It's like the the Indy 500 yeah. soundtrack thing. It's like these little moments that are just sort of joyful filmmaking or yeah. joyful comedy making or whatever. That, uh, that, but like you said, but then balanced out by this. I guess that does speak to the uh, Steven Soderbergh yeah. quality as well. I wonder, it makes me want to go through Soderbergh's work and see where he might be dropping hint, like little hot rock hints. Yeah, like is there not as obvious stuff? stuff. Like the, the three we talked about, yeah, but like is there a hot rock reference in Kafka? <laughs> like is there a hot rock reference in Shay part two? Like <laughs> I, I don't know. It could be. You never know. He clearly like thinks about this movie a lot. So, and speaking of hot rock references, in a, a previous episode, I mentioned the Slater Kinney yeah. album, The Hot Rock, and was saying it's not the same. We want to let people know it's not the same. But you pointed out that they took the cover, yeah, their cover from yeah. The so when there's a poster for, for the, the Hot rock, rock where it's all four guys looking really cool and kind of posing on the street corner. And the album cover for this later Kenny Hot Rock is basically them emulating that poster, which is cool. And I wonder why. <laughs> like, I wonder, like, were they into this movie? The, like, in my mind, it's like they knew someone who had that poster. Because that seems like such a cool dorm room poster to have. They, they saw that poster in somebody's house. Or maybe one of them had that poster. And they were like... Never seen that movie, but man, that's such a cool image. Let's do that same pose, but the three of us will look cool on the cover of our album. And then we'll love it so much, we'll even call our album The Hot Rock. But maybe they love the movie. Like, like maybe they, you know, they got, yeah, they, they were into it. It's very possible. The so- there's no song, there's no reference to the movie in the songs, as far as I can tell. What's really weird to me about it is just, so on The Hot Rock, poster is it robert redford he is who's lean oh no it's it's uh george siegel who's leaning on a uh like a what am i looking for some sort of post what are we what, are, what am i looking for uh lamp post yeah yeah whatever. he's leaning yeah. on a lamp post or a pole and so he has his arm up and then on the slater kinney record uh, Carrie Brownstein is hailing a cab, so she has her hand up. It's weird. It's it's not like they reposed, they like they created that pose from the Hot Rock, but somehow they did. Yeah, in a totally different <laughs> setting. Like you told you, it, it's clearly. I, I I get the feeling that it's the same thing, but it all is is very very different. Which I yeah. think is like, I think that's just an interesting graphic choice. No, I think that's um, cool. like in, yeah, I like that. I like that it didn't just like we'll just do the exact same thing, but like you still like yeah, with her arm up in the same angle, it still like it it evokes the memory of the hot rock poster for whatever few people knew what the fuck that was. <laughs> like, I don't know what like twenty year old buying that album when it came out has any idea what the hot rock poster original poster looked like. <laughs> but, you never know. Some cool kid <laughs> appreciated it. Hey, you know what I just realized? Yeah. There's no love interest in yeah. this movie. Yeah. There is zero romantic plot. I it's, wonder. It's all business. I, some, <laughs> like there are people who might say that's why it didn't succeed. Why it was like if there had been a Robert Redford love story, like the Jennifer Connelly, George Clooney thing and Out of Sight. Jennifer Lopez. But I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Did I say who did I say? You said Jennifer Connelly. Oh, sorry, Jennifer Lopez. Sorry, uh, but I, but I'm I'm glad that there isn't. I don't miss it, but I just it just struck me that that is that's odd. Yeah, You'd think it it would. I like right? I, I yeah. I wonder if the book has one or not because I feel like you tend to pad out a 300 page book by throwing that kind of stuff in like more personal relationships. But I love that the movie's all business. 
you know, like even the Soderbergh movies that reference this, like Logan Lucky and and stuff, like there's kind of relationships going on in there. Like in the Oceans movie, you have Julia Roberts and in the Out of Sight, you, like you said, you have J-Lo and George Clooney. So like, I like that this movie is that like, no, we're just moving forward on a plot. It's just these guys doing a job, the end. Like, I like that a lot. Like, I, yeah, like I didn't even realize that until you pointed out, like, you're right. There is no, like you could have very easily made it where instead of his sister, some other lady is living with you know, George Siegel and then she ends up going with Robert Redford or somebody who works somewhere or like you could have easily worked in a 15, 20 minutes of a love interest, but I'm glad that they did not. And this made a nice, concise, short, fun movie. So, uh, Brian, let's talk a little bit about uh, Donald Westlake, because this isn't the only you know, you mentioned that he wrote uh, Point Blank and yeah. Uh, and he wrote the book that this was based on, but there have been other adaptations of West Westlake uh, novels. Do you want to talk about those for a minute? Yeah. So it's really weird. Like it's like this movie too. It's like they made other movies. They made other movies with the Dortmunder character, but with different actors like based on, cause this is a whole series of books. Like there's a lot of books in this series about these, these him just coming back and trying a new high. So they made a movie in 1974 called The Bank Shot, which is only two years after this movie, but with George C. Scott in the lead role. Did you watch? Have you I seen got, that? I, I watched a little of it, and it's it's really weird. It's super over the top comedy, and George C. Scott has these has these crazy eyebrows. Like he's in <laughs> crazy makeup. He is very not. He's a lot closer to Zero Mostel <laughs> in Robert the Hot Redford. Rock than to Robert Redford. And uh, just watching the first few minutes, it's just like crazy, like <laughs> sort of almost Benny Hill over the top. It's That's really so, weird. Like, why does that exist? That's so weird. Maybe because this movie failed. They're like, well, we can make another one. Try it again. No one will know or think that it's the same person. But maybe if Robert Redford didn't work, maybe George C. Scott is what the people want. Again, <laughs> I don't think that movie was a hit because that's another movie I've never heard of. Uh, then in 1982, this one's a weird one. They made a movie called Jimmy the Kid with Gary Coleman. And his first, his first film. His first post Different Strokes film. And it's also based on these characters. Who plays the Dortmunder in that one? Is it Elliot Gould or something like that? Like... Is it or no, Paula so. Paula Matt? Is that right? Yeah. Does that seem correct? Yeah. So yeah, that's... and they kidnap a kid. Yeah, I read a little bit about it, but I wasn't able to find this one, so I don't <laughs> really know what's going on. Except that Gary Coleman lives in a locker in a <laughs> bus station. <laughs> <laughs> the hard times. And, yeah. So it's <laughs> yeah. So it was a documentary. <laughs> <what you're> <laughs> and then, okay, and then this is a movie I actually heard of, but I didn't know it was related. In 2001, there's the movie What's the Worst That Could Happen with Martin Lawrence as the Dartmunder character and Danny DeVito. That, so I've never seen that, but I remember when that came out, and I think I would have seen it if I had known it had anything to do with, like, Donald Westlake. Did you, have you seen that one? I was actually I was watching it this morning. I didn't get to the end of it, but it's it's definitely an enjoyable film. It fe- it's of the these three. It's the one that feels like it's the closest to the hot rock. Um, there's <laughs> I, I don't even know. This is one of those things that like I notice. I don't know if anyone notices, but there's there's one moment when so. Uh, Martin Lawrence's partner is played by John Leguizamo and uh, his name, that character's name is Berger. And <laughs> there's a point when Martin Lawrence is like, move your ass, Berger. <laughs> I was like, is that, is, is that one of those things? Like, did he mean that as a joke about Asperger's or is that just one of those? I don't because 2001 I feel is a kind of too early for like people in the public weren't talking about Asperger's as much. But I feel it's more of a more recent thing. 
I feel like it showed up on, it wasn't, when was Ally McBeal? Because there was a character in Ally McBeal who had Asperger's. And, and that, they actually called was... it and they said the word Asperger's? Yeah. Oh, that was late 90s, so I guess that's before this. I don't yeah. know. I like Maybe? <laughs> or I'm thinking Mark anyway. Lawrence was just riffing and told him to move his ass and his name was Burger. Y- you never know. It's possible. Either way. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the kind of thing I enjoy. Uh, but it's a it's a fun film, and it has that same quality of like failed one failed heist after another, building to one big heist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the I, it where I ended watching just because I had to start recording this. There's a scene where Danny DeVito plays a guy who's trying to own too many. This is this dates the film own too many TV stations in one market. <laughs> when the when that was still being uh, open the when Congress was still trying I guess ostensibly trying to keep people from doing that, and he's at a congressional hearing and Martin Lawrence calls him on the phone to like mess with him and it leads to Danny DeVito telling the TV cameras to fuck off and giving them the finger and get, and like yelling at the TV cameras in the middle of this uh, <laughs> congressional hearing in a way that makes no sense, but is really, you know, it's just like, it's the kind of comedy this is. It's, it, it, this film does not happen. It, it, this ha- So it feels a little bit like the hot rock, but it also feels like a little bit like a world in which Gary Coleman might be living in a locker. <laughs> in a bus station. Maybe they should have had it where Martin Lawrence plays Gary Coleman 20 years later, older. And what does living in a locker do to your psyche <laughs> as a grown up? <laughs> And that's how that you become be like life of crime. <laughs> I want that Jimmy the Kid sequel fan film. <laughs> so, is there anything else that we want to talk about about this yeah. film, Brian? Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. There, it's one one striking thing that you'll notice when you watch a movie is you see the construction of the twin towers, which is really an odd feeling to see in a movie now post 9-11 and like they're half built and in the movie they're flying really close to it in a helicopter (laughs) so it's a little unsettling now knowing where history went with that but like it's it just definitely like stands out as sort of like a moment like in a moment of fun in the movie you're kind of like oh whoa you know you know even though it's been what 20 years like i'm still like oh whoa yeah I, i and i guess that brings me to what was uh, sort of what struck me when I first saw the film about it, because at the time when I saw this film, I was, I I'd written a book and I was working with a group called SyncBook who were involved in tracking synchronicities in media. And at the time there were a lot there's a lot of work around tracking down images of the World Trade Center in films before 9/11 and sort of seeing what clues and hints they might give us about just our history and what that all means and so i was in that mindset when i saw this film and i have to say when they when the helicopter was approaching the towers that scene was so stressful for me (laughs) and it goes on a long time and and there's no payoff to the stress like in the movie it's not really there's it's it's just a helicopter flying around there's no reason that it's so stressful so i was there was a part of me was like well am i just projecting this stress because of what I know about the Twin Towers, or is the film actually saying this is really scary? And it, and I looked at it again, watching it, and the film really does like this is the only time Robert Redford looks like he's not <laughs> he's not cool. Like he yeah. does not like being up in that helicopter. Well, he is scared. Well, because also right before, like they they were basically not even employing, but just saying Ron Liebman does not know how to fly a helicopter. Like he just he's learning, and when they're is sitting down, he's like flipping switches, thinking like I think this is how you do it. And they're all kind of like, we're all gonna fucking die. This is gonna crash into a building while we're trying to seal this damn diamond. Like it's definitely, and I think also, I mean, maybe in real life, Robert Redford 
maybe doesn't enjoy flying in a helicopter. I know I I don't want to go up in a helicopter. Like they're kind of scary. Yeah, they but they don't have act- doors. I mean, again, like, it's the director is making that choice to show him as scared. Yeah, you know, like there's yeah. all these stories about people. Wasn't it, who was it who? I'm trying to think. Was it like maybe when Pacino played a race car? Or, there's some story about some famous race car driver in a movie, and the guy is actually is afraid to drive, but he's still great in the movie. You can do that movie magic. I'm, I, I feel like that's a choice. Like, yeah. That's not just Robert Redford being afraid to be in the film because they make such a point of it. Yeah. Uh, I guess my point was that it really, really stressed me out when I saw that. So I was having a similar reaction. And I guess is now a good time. I, I, uh, I'm, I had a conversation with my friend Alan Abadessa who started Syncbook Press and I wanted to do a little primer for people about what sync film is and how this film I know demonstrates that. So is is now a good time to kick to that interview? Why not? Let's do it. Go crazy. Hi everybody. Sorry to interrupt this show that you're probably enjoying, but I'm comedian Kevin Dombrowski, who you probably don't know. Joined weekly by my producer, Adam, a little bit more well-known than me, Hineker. Say hi, Adam. True. He's got a point. Uh, Dial it back. Each episode, I'll sit down with a very famous comedian that you probably do know, and if they're not famous, you probably know them anyway, and we'll break down what's happening in the world by making fun of all of it. This is Just Joking on the Paper House Network. No interviews, no arguments, just jokes. Now, back to your show that you were already enjoying. Hey, Alan Abadessa Green. Welcome to the World is Wrong podcast. Thank you so much, Andras. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you again today. So I invited you here because the film The Hot Rock made me want to talk about sync film and what is sync film. And rather than just explaining it to Brian, I thought I would invite you because as uh, someone who is was the founder of Sync Book Press and put out several books and has written and been just been a part of many podcasts that explore uh, the concept of synchronicity in media and particularly in film. I thought you'd be a perfect person to hold forth on that. So, um, so could would you mind telling our audience what Sync Film is and maybe some. Uh, nodes of exposure that people could explore if they're interested in finding out more about sync film. Sure. Um, well, I guess I'm going to start by saying there's a, a few different interpretations of what that term could mean. I think for some people, the the oldest idea of this uh, might be something like uh, was it Wizard of Oz with Dark Side of the Moon, where you're taking a, a piece of film and you're taking a piece of music, and then you are synchronizing those two and creating a new media experience? So most people are familiar with that Dark Side of the Moon uh, type deal. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of David Plate who makes a ton of films like that, uh, combining all sorts of things, like what is a uh, Rosemary's Baby with the Beatles White Album and all that sort of stuff, right? Uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. It's just one iteration of sync film. Then you might have something, say, like Rodney Asher's Room 237. I don't know if your audience is familiar with that film. Um, that is a documentary that explores some of the synchronicities and sort of uh, multiple interpretations, taking the, the film The Shining, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, And having a bunch of different people look at this film and say, oh, I think it means this. I think it means this. Hey, did you notice this weird thing that happens here that could be interpreted as X, Y, Z? While I've spoken to Rodney Asher and he does not consider himself a sync filmmaker, I and many people within the sync genre consider that to be a type of sync film because it's playing with those same pieces. It's that deconstructing a a piece of media, looking at it through these multiple lenses. Um, But I think what you're really trying to ask me about today and what 
I've spent the last, oh gosh, uh, 12 years or so really knee deep in is a type of sync film that was pioneered by a guy named Jake Katza. Um, you, I would highly recommend the work of guys like Kevin Halcott and Richard Arrowsmith. Uh, these foundational filmmakers who were taking pieces of pop culture, uh, whether that be current media or looking at old films and just noticing weird <laughs> weird things within them. And that's, that's, I know that's such a vague uh, uh, expanse, but uh, for example, I love there's a uh, Richard Arrowsmith did a film which is like every Bruce Willis film that mentions cats, and it just starts to pile up to the point where you're like, okay, it's genuinely bizarre how many times <laughs> you know cats come up um, in Bruce Willis films. Uh, that's a silly example, but it's the sort of thing where you kind of start to pick up these these threads or these nodes of reoccurring imagery. Uh, Jay Katza was one who started to incorporate ideas of like Jungian psychology. This is where you get, right, uh, Carl Jung is the guy who invented the term synchronicity, which means a meaningful coincidence. Uh, so there's not necessarily any kind of uh, intention ever suggested here. Uh, it's not like, oh, this filmmaker necessarily put in these cat references, for example, but that they are... Um, uh, maybe archetypes, uh, to use Jungian terms, these are archetypes that maybe um, Bruce Willis might resonate with or uh, or almost represent or embody himself. Uh, there's this common analogy is used that we might, in previous iterations of talking about these esoteric concepts, we might talk about stars in the sky and that uh, Katz's form of pop culture mysticism was using the stars of Hollywood as our interpretive elements. Well, I think Jake Kotze is a, probably a good connecting point here to the hot rock because, well, so much of his work seems like it uh, is connected to what he calls the mega ritual of 9-11, and uh, and then, which involves exploring the appearance of the World Trade Center in media leading up to September 11th, 2001. Um, is that how you, was that a correct way to explain that? I, I believe so. Um, I think it's, I would say definitely in the early days of synchromistic films and these explorations people i think you got to realize this a lot of this stuff started probably around 2007 i would say uh this really began to take off as a a cultural phenomenon and i think what was happening on the internet while again while these folks are not themselves conspiracy theorists there were so many things that were happening on the internet where maybe people were looking, you know, 9-11 is still being a very current and fresh relevant news item, but also people taking the time to explore it uh, and re-explore it constantly for those next few years, whether that be for conspiracy reasons or not. And what ends up happening is there was these slew of websites that just kind of kept churning out Oh, did you notice that Neo's passport in the Matrix is September eleventh, two thousand one? And people are like, oh, okay, that's that's fascinating. What does that imply? Uh, what 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 can we interpret from that? Um, or is it just a, an interesting coincidence, a meaningful coincidence? Uh, I would say Kotz in particular, as you said, really focused on this idea of nine eleven as this mega ritual. And again, he was not necessarily implying an intentionality, but saying that all the iconography, the the Twin Towers, which were, uh, if you look at the the architect, intention did say, I am designing these to be in resonance with uh, Solomon's Temple. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Scott Onstott who has shown that is like they are 
mathematically proportional with Solomon's temple as as depicted in the Bible, as described, like what units of measurement and all this sort of stuff. It's all to scale. Uh, there's also the building across the street, which um, is known as the Millennium Hilton Hotel, which, again, the architect of that building said he intentionally designed to look like the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey. So then Katza says, well, wait a second, you have a a building that is designed to resonate with an event, a major event in the year 2001, and it's literally front and center in this major event that happens in the year 2001. Uh, suddenly we have this ritualistic temple space. This The World Trade Center is designed after this ritualistic temple space. Hey, what... <laughs> What's happening here? I think really it starts with that question of what what do we what do we make of this? And we start to look at all these different uh, examples. I had made uh, last year. I made a a documentary series called Hindsight 2020, and in the first episode, I give a few minute breakdown to just exploring a slew of these different pieces of media that predate 9/11 that people realized, oh, they could be seen as predictions, let's say. Um, And I think that culminates, there was a a film made by a friend of mine, Joe Alexander, in 2015 that most people might have seen. It was called Back to the Future Predicts 9-11. That was a sync film that really made it big on the internet. Uh, And that's the type of thing where it's saying, hey, we have this piece of media that comes out in the 80s, and suddenly we can see all these ways in which it really seems to foreshadow or even if you want to use these the stronger language of predicting this event. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that Carl Jung's idea of synchronicity was, A, that it was the, the quote, a causal, meaning uh, not just cause and effect, but a... Um, implying a, a weirder sense of of causality um, or a more abstract sense of causality right, where people will say, oh, correlation does not mean causation. Carl Jung is saying we're not looking at causation here. We're just – we are looking at correlation. Uh, the other thing would be nonlinear would be the other phrase that I think is really important here. Um, When we say it doesn't have to happen in the sequential order of events, we're just looking at how these events are similar. And so I think that is why we get so much of this predictive, quote-unquote, material is because it is nonlinear. We're saying, hey, here is something that seems to depict a 9-11 event that was made in the 80s. How do we want to look at that? How do we want to start to examine that? And I think for the hot rock, what you sort of clued in on was this – there's this extended scene. starts about an hour into the film where these guys get into a helicopter and are flying past the World Trade Center that was under construction at the time. And I, you know, part of me wants to say, again, from a causality idea, this is – a major piece of construction that's happening. This is a major landmark, and they have the opportunity to showcase it in their film and, and get a bunch of footage of it, and they wanted to really feature it in their film. You know, again, it doesn't have to be um, a- a- any more intricate of a reason than that. Uh, but I think when you look at this with, gosh, what is this, 40 years of context? What what year is the the Hot Rock come out? Seventy two. Seventy two. Okay, so fifty years later, we're looking at this piece of cinema, and the context is completely different. We're not looking at this as this hot new piece of, you know, New York real estate. We're looking at this as the site of the nine eleven terrorist attacks. So um, when I think that catches your eye, and then you start to notice. You mentioned there's a uh, a scene that follows it where there's a I don't want to I don't I, do we do spoilers on your yeah, show it's, I don't it's fine we 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 let people know that we do spoilers so go ahead cool okay 
So there is a scene with a um, hypnotist is trying to hypnotize this um, banker. And she says, okay, the phrase, the, the sort of key phrase here is going to be Afghanistan, banana stand. And I think for you, the, the alarms start to ring of, hey, we have the World Trade Center and then the mention of Afghanistan in a short window. This seems like a synchronicity to me. I notice in between those two scenes, we have a, another major thing that really leapt out to me, which is that helicopter, which flies past the World Trade Center, goes and commits a raid on a police station. And there's literally a line where one of the police officers is like, sir, there's, there's bombs and gas in the stairwell. I mean, to me, that really evokes imagery of 9-11, this uh, po- you know, policeman trapped in stairwells filled with smoke. Uh, I thought that was really powerful. Uh, you know, did you recognize who that, I think I'm, it's, I'm pretty sure, do you know who that policeman was? I do, I do not, know. That was Christopher Guest. Oh, really? In a really early film appearance, yeah. Gotcha, okay. Uh, here's something else, I mean, I, I just thought was interesting, the, when the, I believe it's at the end of the raid, I think when the helicopter's flying off, the police chief says, I'm not going to be the first, you know, I'm not gonna be, I'm not going to be the first uh, guy to lose a precinct on American soil or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting in light of this year's current events of um, the police station being burned down in Minnesota and whatnot. Uh, again, these are just things that, you can interpret in any which way you want, but I, I just, you know, again, the context in which you are bringing to the situation with my eyes and current events that are swirling around me, these lines of this 50-year-old film suddenly jump out with totally different context, right? Yeah. And, well, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but I just thought about it while we were talking. Uh, but... What do you make of the hostility that some people have to a film like Room 237? I, as I feel like that's, as you said, that's the most popular example of this kind of film, even though the director himself says he doesn't consider it to be a sync film. And we're going to be talking about Room 237 in a future episode, for sure, as a film that the world is wrong about. But... Is there anything, like, do you have any take on why people who are not particularly interested in synchronicities, but just who, who, like, I felt like the cultural reaction to that film was, I think, more hostile than the film warranted. And since we're a a podcast that looks at how the film, how the world is wrong about films and that has to deal with prejudice and whatnot, do you have any take on that, on why people might have responded so negatively to that film i think again i think a lot of it has to do with our personal context right so i think everyone is afraid when they're presented with information that seems new and weird it's almost like a what are you selling or what are you implying right and i think Particularly when, again, I was just having lived through this for the last 12 years with synchro mysticism, you talk about 9-11 on the internet, that automatically gets lumped in with conspiracy theories and things like that. So there's always this sort of weird, tinged, I don't know, uh, pushback that, that comes with it, even though, even though that's not the... Uh, the direction we're taking with this, it sort of gets lumped in with that. And when Room 237 came out, honestly, I was so excited because I was like, hey, here's this guy who made a film that doesn't touch, you know, like I just thought it was so well made and so dances that fine line. 
Uh, yes, he does ex- uh, include one conspiracy theorist, the guy uh, – I can't think of his name at the moment. The guy who says that uh, Stanley Kubrick faked the moon landing, uh, Jay Widener. Um, and he inc- – so I believe there's six interviewees, one of whom is a conspiracy theorist. Others, I mean, are like – some of them are actually like well-established film critics and um, – just people, just people taking this, these totally other approaches to the conversation. Yet, the I remember the day that we're leading up to like Room Two Three Seven is getting this this actual theatrical release, and at the time being really excited for it. That like, oh, here's someone exploring the kind of material I am doing it in this really approachable way and in this really level-headed way and getting mainstream attention and then like the New York Times review comes out and it says Room 237 a film about conspiracies in the Stanley Kubrick's The Shining and I'm like wait a second I don't I just watched this film and I didn't I didn't see a film about conspiracy theories you know there was of of a two-hour film there's maybe 20 minutes of it uh, if that of a guy talking about conspiracy theories um so, unfortunately, the uh, the New York Times review was par for the course. I mean, all the reviews, most of the the reaction that I saw, even speaking to people, uh, I remember being so excited again, so excited about that film, and being heartbroken every time I found someone who actually had taken the time to watch that film. The response I got from people was, "Yeah, just it was so weird, like all these conspiracy theories about." The Shining, and I—I uh, I don't remember exactly how you framed your question, but like, why, wh- why is there such well, pushback? It's really, I just think. what do you make of it? And I think you get you. I mean, that's yeah. really, you give a great, a great answer. I mean, it's it's this thing that it, <laughs> yeah, it, it's this thing that unfortunately there is some. The, the stink and tar of that one guy talking about conspiracies seems to get on the whole project uh, for, for a lot of people. And that's really, really, really a shame because I think that film stands up so well uh, as – I mean it's it's almost like a book club. It's like a – it's like it's more like a literary reading of film uh, – is how I, I see that film. I don't think there's anything particularly shocking or um, antagonistic about it. Uh, I definitely think the world is wrong about that film. I can't, I can't, they're just so wrong about even what it's about, let alone ha- how to begin to interpret it. But uh, if, if anything, that almost gets to the heart of what this is, right, which is multiple people looking at the same film are going to see drastically different things and in a weird way the response to room 237 almost speaks to what room 237 was exploring in the first place yeah yeah well before i let you go what are you working on these days what do you want to point people to you mentioned hindsight 2020 i'll post the link for that in uh, our show notes but is there anything else you'd like to let people know about Sure. Yeah, I would really love it if people checked out Hindsight 2020. Uh, It's a five-part documentary series, um, which I started in uh, 2019 and became suddenly all the more relevant uh, as 2020 played out the way it has. Uh, The other thing I'd point out is a, a friend of ours, Will Morgan, has just started a new series which explores synchronicity in a much more friendly, approachable, comical sort of way. He's, his series is called Meta Egg, and it's just a sort of lighthearted take on pop culture synchronicities. I think that's really good. Um, and uh, keep listening to The World is Wrong and Radio 8 Ball and see see what kind of synchronicities come your way. 
And before we get back to my conversation with Brian, as luck would have it, after I recorded my interview with Alan Green, he conducted an interview for his podcast, Always Record, with Rodney Asher, the director of Room 237, and the new film coming out in February, A Glitch in the Matrix. And in that interview, Alan asked Rodney what he thought about the claims that Room 237 engages in conspiracy theory. Let's check it out. Even when I was so excited your film coming out, And then seeing like the New York Times reviewed it as this is a film about various conspiracy theories. And I and every time I hear somebody say that, I it confuses me because it's really only one conspiracy theory is Jay Widener. Everything else is just sort of film criticism or theory. Where is the how is everything labeled a conspiracy theory when there's just one guy? You know, two three seven being called a conspiracy theory movie, which. It was it's just as weird to me because it's we spend about seven minutes, if that, you know, in a movie that's, you know, well over an hour and a half, it's close to an hour and 40 and everything else is symbolic interpretation of a of, of a of a popular piece of art. But you can't really. Well, it's, you know, like with Kubrick's experience with, the you know, Kubrick made The Shining and then us and, you know, an endless number of people you know, have our two cents about what it is and how we want to talk about it. So I can't exactly complain when people talk about my stuff in a way that's not necessarily, you know, how I would frame it. Time passes. So, yeah, so uh, when when you're not uh, when you're not co-hosting this podcast, the World is Wrong podcast, you co-host another film podcast called the director's wall with the your your co-host wall. AJ Gonzalez, and in that podcast you explore a uh, a filmmaker's full filmography. You're in the middle of exploring the world of Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah, who uh, who was one of the writers on the script for The Great Gatsby, starring yeah. Robert Redford. Great so movie. there's a little connection there. Yeah. But what film are you up to now in your explorations? <laughs> well, after many incorrect predictions on our last many episodes of where we would be we are actually on the movie hammett which he sort of maybe rumor has it could have sort of took it over from vim vendors and directed part of it or at least re-edited a bunch of it so we're going to explore dig into that and see if we find any truth to that and I, i've never seen the movie i'm very excited and it's about uh, it's another frederick Forrest joint this is like on the high of frederick Forrest that coppola was writing and uh, I'm excited. Like, we're in the, I think, the most exciting part for me of his career. Like, I'm really into the 80s stuff. Like, this is why I wanted to do Coppola, because these are the movies that, like, the, to me, it fits in with our message of our show here. Like, it feel like these are the movies that people tend to, like, think are terrible or disregard or, you know, cast aside. But I find that they're going to be really interesting to talk about and, and to give a second glance at. So I'm very excited to really go through all the 80s stuff. Is there any connection between the Hot Rock and Hammett? <laughs> no, I don't Ron think. Liebman show up? No, in, in, no, in it's Hammett? Just, no. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> so well, well, you know, I'll I'll report after I've seen it. Like, there, I'll I'll look for it. I'll be looking for it. Uh, and so, Andres, you also host another show. We are such busy podcasters of the twenty first century. Uh, called the Radio so Eight Ball, sh- <laughs> Radio Eight Ball Show, uh, where you, I, I, I always have, to, I don't know why, I always have trouble t- saying exactly what it is because I feel like it, it change, it changes in a way. Like it's not, you, it's not like you fo- follow a strict formula of every show. You do in a way, but it seems well, like we this, do. Like, I mean, basically, it, we have a very simple, simple. I don't know why this is hard for you. I don't Brian. know why it it's always a very simple is format. <laughs> we answer questions by picking songs at random and then interpreting them like musical tarot cards. And there's yeah. a lot of different ways we do it. Sometimes we do it with a live band. Sometimes we use our Radio 8 Ball app. Sometimes, uh, you know, we can do it in a lot of different ways. I think I feel but, weird uh, just saying that's what it is because it makes it seem like a game show, which it's not. And then it gets so much of the show is not just that. It's like you have these big, great conversations with guests that have nothing to do with picking songs at random necessarily. 
So I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I'm not doing it justice. Yeah. Like I feel like I need. I'm always a letdown when I try to build it up. <laughs> there is no justice. There is no justice. <laughs> well, anyways, yes, that is what your show is. But have you? Okay, have you ever had Slater Kenny or any members of Slater Kenny on the show since you live in Olympia and they used to live in Olympia? No, I have not. Uh, but I do have a weird sort of connection to Slater Kenny. First of all, I was in class. I was in class with Carrie Brownstein at Evergreen in the, whatever, like the er, the early nineties. And she actually complained about me to the professor and said <laughs> I was, that just my presence was intimidating to her and made it hard for her to express herself, which She's obviously overcome, so uh, <laughs> I like to take like, a little bit of cre- I take you, a little a little credit for for her success. Were you just like yeah. silent and brooding in the class? Like were you just like perched mm. on a desk, just like with an arched eyebrow? Like what were you? No, doing? no, I was probably like the like I do with you. I was probably you know she was she came, she said something and I interrupted. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Look like like this, like this, like this. She's like. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't know what it was. She just, the, the, but it was not that I was too quiet because it was the, the note from the professor was like, maybe you could just tone it down. A little bit. <laughs> could you try and brood a little bit more? <laughs> like, I'm not a brooder. <laughs> try it. You might like it. That's funny. But but then I had a crazy. This is the the, the fun synchronicity for me is. So around that time, I was at Kinko's making a band flyer for my band, and Carrie Brownstein and Kathleen Hanna from the band Bikini Kill were in that Kinko's, and they were making a flyer looking for a drummer for a new band, which would become Slater Kinney. And so it's just one of those in Olympia moments where it's like you, it's like a, you know that thing in the movie The Wanderers where mm-hmm. you see like a Bob Dylan like he's yeah. like oh I'm going to go see a folk singer and yeah. then you see that the the flyer for Bob Dylan on the it's like that's that's sort of the world building that you might do if you're going to make a movie about Olympia yeah. in the 90s <laughs> is like oh this oh they're making a flyer for this band <laughs> oh and that band's going to grow up to be Slater Kinney. I used to I worked at that Kinkos for years. That was one of Did my you, jobs. Not, Were not you one, one of those people who gave away a lot of free copies? No, I was like, right. I had my roommate was one of them, and he got majorly busted and owed them thousands of dollars. And he luckily didn't go to jail. But no, I was a little goody two shoes. <laughs> I was just a little goody two shoes who followed the rules and made copies for people and made sure they paid that nickel. I wasn't gonna get like wasn't get busted. Like they they have that was like, the most notorious kinkos in Olympia because <laughs> you. If you knew the right person, you could go in there and just like free. Make, yeah. <laughs> but like speaking of the free hot rock, copies that yeah. like they they I don't know if it was because of that, but like they have security systems like a bank there. At least when I worked there, they had cameras pointed at everything. Probably because I like to think it was only at the Olympia one that they had cameras pointed everywhere because of all the free flyers that were made for bands, probably like Slater Candy and whatever, from <laughs> these people working at Kinko's. So great. Great times. <laughs> uh, it's a different, a different era. A different era. <laughs> what are we doing next week? Oh, boy. Well, it's kind of, kind of a double feature because we're going to be doing another crime film that starts with a major movie star of the 70s getting out of prison. Straight Time from 1978 starring Dustin Hoffman. Ooh, and, uh, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And so we encourage you to track that film down, check it out by next week so that you'll be up to speed with us when we talk about it. And if you liked this podcast about the hot rock, please give us nice reviews and ratings, especially at Apple podcast, because that helps people find us. And if there's anything we missed or things you'd like to comment on or make suggestions or critique you can reach us at contact at the world is wrong podcast.com you can also find us at the world is wrong podcast on instagram and 
if you'd like to get some The World is Wrong swag, T-shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, you can check out the merchandise link at our page at theworldiswrongpodcast.com and get yourself fully outfitted for a world which is only going to get more and more wrong. <laughs> this is this is like our our shirts are like forever stamps. Yeah. They're just they're not going It's not like the world is going to start getting right anytime soon. It, so it, it never was in the first place. It's only So been gear wrong. up people. <laughs> Um, and did I miss anything? Just say right. that you have to say the end thing, right? Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll say the end thing. Okay. Fine. I'm so predictable. Okay. Well, <laughs> folks, just remember wherever you are, the world is wrong. And it's probably wrong about you. Hey, we made the daily news. What? What did I say? Yeah, yeah. Listen, listen. Uh, 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 Priceless Jewel, Sahara. So. Uh, says that the museum, the dazzlingly successful operation was handled by four men, one of whom escaped from a city hospital ambulance by savagely assaulting a doctor. Oh, for Another that has been identified savagely as assaulting I just the popped West them. Village. That ain't savage. You expect rotten reporting from the Times. This here's a good paper. I don't understand. Success. <laughs> did they say anything about what we did with the diamond? What? Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting the World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Show.